Well, what do you think? It's a little past noon. Should we go ahead and uh, yeah. get started? All right. All right. Here we go. All right. Well, welcome, students, to another installment of the Science Circle panel discussion series. I'm very excited about today's topic, climate change. The Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, the IPCC, is the United Nations body for assessing the science related to climate change. It recently issued a report which looked at the effects of a 1.5 degree warming, which is less than previously modeled. Um, I think they had um, really been looking at a two degree rise, so and they wanted to see what the effects of um, a slightly uh, lower amount of warming would do, and they discovered that the effects, even with a small amount of warming, are alarming and will be noticeable soon. So to discuss this and all the other things global warming, we have with us today an outstanding panel. Um, Wordsmith Jarvanen, I think may be familiar to some of you here in Second Life. Um, uh, Keith Grant holds a doctorate in engineering and applied science from the University of California, Davis, UC Davis, of the UC system. Uh, Dr. Grant was attached to the Atmospheric Sciences Division at Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory, where he helped develop atmospheric chemical radiation transport models and climate models. He also worked at the Center for Applied Scientific Computing on developing massively parallel numerical solvers. Um, so Wordsmith is um, uh, is a climate scientist, and I think we'll be able to uh, really inform us in an interesting way. Uh, Vic Matulak, uh, Phil Youngblood, founded the uh, Computational Information Systems and Cybersecurity Degree Programs at Incarnate Word University. Uh, he is a trained biochemist. He's visited 40 countries and has been a popular science circle contributor since 2008, including a recent presentation on the Anthropocene era. And then we also have with us um, uh, uh, Syzygy um, Asymptote, um, is a working astronomer currently at the National Institute of Astrophysics, Optics, and Electronics in Puebla, Mexico and has a doctorate from the University of Texas at Boston. Um, so um, I'd like to, for each of our panel members to also make some opening remarks. So Vic, uh, why don't you uh, say a few words about the topic or about yourself, and uh, we'll get started. OK, sure. Welcome, everyone here. My role on the panel is not as an expert in the field, but as an educated, responsible, concerned world citizen. Because in the end, it doesn't matter who we are, or what we know or believe. It uh, the people that make the decisions and people worldwide really are the people we need to talk to. Um, I did do the. I've been concerned with about the impact of humans on our environment since the '60s, when the issues were pollution and how to feed an overpopulated world. And I've been following climate change for about 20 years, and I gave the first presentation on the Anthropocene epic, which is the concept that humans could or are affecting the Earth as much as natural sources. So I expect the other panelists to supply the science, but I'm here to kind of dispel some myths that, uh, for example, the idea of uh, climate change versus global warming, uh, climate deniers, uh, the causes, uh, the kind of so what thing, in other words, one to two degrees, so what? Uh, and lasting effects. So I'll hand it over to our other panelists and uh, we'll get started. Fantastic, that was a great opening. Um, Syzygy, would you like to make some remarks? Yes, thanks. Uh, thanks, Baragon. I, I, uh, uh, thanks for accepting my offer to be on this panel. Um, uh, this is a, a, a vital subject for me and for all of us as Vic, uh, Said that uh, yeah, I'm not a I'm not an expert on the subject either. Being an astronomer, of course, I'll understand the basic physics of climate change. Um, but as in any field, the devil's in the details, and I keep informed on the subject because, as I said before, it's vital for all of us. 
Um, Keith is going to explain uh, the mechanisms of global, uh, global warming or climate change. I nonetheless offer my own explanation, which will be uh, probably from a slightly different angle, <clears throat> starting with something that uh, very simple, very simple things that we observe in everyday life can have profound consequences. One of those is that we can see the sun. On a clear day, and there are many clear days in many places on the Earth, as we can see the sun, which means that the atmosphere is not really absorbing the light of the sun very effectively. That means that the atmosphere, which is warm, must get its heat from elsewhere, and it gets it from the Earth beneath our feet, which is opaque, so it does absorb the light of the sun. It scatters some of it away, but it absorbs the light of the sun and heats the atmosphere above us. And the way the atmosphere cools, the only way the atmosphere can cool across the vacuum of space is by radiation. And at the temperature of the Earth, that radiation is infrared radiation. So if the infrared, if the atmosphere is opaque at infrared wavelengths, then it's like wrapping a blanket around the Earth. And it slows the rate at which the infrared radiation leaks away until the temperature rises to compensate for it. And uh, <clears throat> this is called the greenhouse effect. And the greenhouse effect existed long before human beings were on the scene, but we human beings are messing with that greenhouse effect. We're adding greenhouse gases. It's like adding other blankets or thickening the blankets that already exist. And that is an absolutely insane thing to do as we've been in the last few, a couple decades. Because we can already see the consequences. Animals are dying. Plants are dying. Human beings are dying, not to mention entire ecosystems. Our entire worldwide civilization is at stake. If we don't change our bad habits, billions will die. We must do something. I'm hoping panel discussions like this will be at least a tiny step in the right direction. And on that cherry note, I conclude my Thank you. Very good and sobering. And it, I have to say it brought to mind the uh, the clip from Futurama um, about global warming, where the <laughs> the greenhouse gases beat up on the, on the sunlight. Um, and uh, finally, um, uh, Wordsmith, would you uh, please uh, um, lead us into uh, the science of, uh, uh, of uh, global warming and uh, climate change and uh, uh, kind of make your introductory remarks, please? I'd be happy to, Berrigan. Um, and, you know, thanks to the other panelists for um, bringing different perspectives, too, that uh, uh, Vic has that biochem background, which is not where I'm as strong on, but um, global warming slash climate change is going to have a profound effect on the biochem world. And uh, this is G's uh, comments on uh, from the uh, astronomical side um, or along lines uh, that I'll add to a bit. So. Um, Global warming um, is basically a pretty simple measure. It doesn't tell you a whole lot. It tells you that averaged over the globe and over the year um, what the temperature is. And it doesn't tell you anything about where it's heating, where it might be cooling. It doesn't tell you anything about um, how circulation might change, um, and other effects of the warming. And in fact, it's simple enough that um, it was estimated to be 3 degrees centigrade back in um, 1967 by Suki Manabe and Dick Weatherall in it. They estimated the direct effect of CO2 was about 1 degree warming and the effect of the atmosphere warming and being able to take on more water vapor was another two degrees. So a total of about three degrees. So, you know, that was a simple global average, annual average model. 
All it had was radiation and convection. Um, so that's a starting point. You would expect, based on that, that um, increasing CO2 would warm. Climate change, on the other hand, includes all the effects of that adding heat to the Earth. Uh, and global warming is basically just a measure of um, adding heat to the Earth in a manner that affected the surface temperature. Not all heat coming into the Earth does. Um, both cl climate change includes all the feedbacks, the, the change in reflectivity of the Earth, the change in um, surface vegetation, the season length and of rainfall and where it occurs. So a lot more that it takes a lot more complicated model to figure out. Um, you don't need a full climate model to estimate global warming, but you do to start eyeing effects down to local regions. For both global warming and climate change, um, there's what we can call the the natural part and the anthropogenic or human caused part. Um, the climate has varied you know over millions of years and will keep on varying. Um, right now um, we have good measurements of the total solar radiation uh, from orbit and if anything, the sun is at a bit of a minimum right now. Um, so it's not going to be causing any warming. And the orbit of the Earth, which changes over time, um, is approaching, is small in eccentricity, meaning non-roundness, and is approaching a minimum. So there are estimates that this is going to be a very long interglacial period. Uh, because the forcing to create um, ice ages just won't be there while the eccentricity is so small, and that could be 10,000 to 50,000 or more years. Um, so the natural part of climate change is basically not in the loop right now. Um, and some of the considerations from that don't apply with mankind greatly increasing CO2. The, uh, some people have said, well, ice ages or the end of ice ages uh, preceded the rise, the, the feedback to CO2. Well, that doesn't really matter because we're not talking about a natural ice age natural change in the climate. Um, as to global warming, uh, we live in a world and always has, humans always have pretty much lived in a world um, with natural global warming. warming. The um, surface te temperature that would balance the sunlight absorbed um, is about uh, 255 Kelvin or minus 18 centigrade degrees. Um, if we were living on that planet and the atmosphere didn't interact with the infrared radiation, it would be a far different planet. There wouldn't be any moisture in the air. Um, it would be too cold. Um, and it wouldn't be a comfortable place. But because of that natural CO2 and natural methane, um, that's moved that radiation to space um, up to a higher altitude. And that higher altitude has a, creates an effective radiation temperature of the 255 Kelvin. But the surface temperature average is about uh, plus 15 degrees centigrade. So we've got a 33 degree difference just in terms of nature. And there's no a priori reason that increasing the CO2 won't keep increasing that separation between um, 
surface and the level that's radiating to space. Am I making sense so far? Um, yes. So um, the 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 strata from that is radiating heat from Earth is getting higher. Right. Um, so the um, is the amount of heat being radiated diminished by that, or is yes, the uh, rate of radiation slowing down? Yes, um, because of the CO two. Um, by the way. Um, the effects of CO2 on warming have a signature. So, you know, we know um, that it's due to a greenhouse effect because the troposphere warms and the stratosphere cools. That's not true for other types of radiation changes like incoming solar radiation. Um, so we have a signature and we also have that the um, Fossil fuels are depleted in carbon-14 because they've been down under the ground a long time and the carbon-14 hasn't been exposed to the um, cosmic rays and has decayed away. Um, you know, we can understand global warming fairly simply. Uh, it doesn't take a climate model uh, to understand it. Um, Think of a bucket, a bucket with water, and you have an LED light um, in a little waterproof case and on a, a string or rope, and you lower it into the bucket. Well, you can see the light from the LED uh, from above the bucket, no problem. Water is transparent. Uh, start adding ink, and the water is no longer transparent. You have to, if you add enough uh, ink, you're going to have to raise that LED off the bottom until you can see it. Um, and if you add more ink, you're going to have to raise it higher in the bucket until you can see it. And if you look at it from the other side, uh, when you can see the LED, the LED can see out of the bucket into open space. And that same thing is happening in the atmosphere, in the infrared, with um, CO2. That as you increase the CO2, the effect of altitude of radiating to space gets higher. And you know, conversely, the altitude that um, a satellite could see down into the atmosphere at a given wavelength gets higher because there's just more um, opacity. Now, the atmosphere, the upper atmosphere and the troposphere is tied to the surface via convection. And it decreases, the temperature decreases in, in general as you increase in altitude. So that increase in altitude in the effect of radiation altitude um, means that it's happening at a colder temperature, what you were just saying. And the uh, radiation of infrared is strongly dependent on the temperature. If you think of integrating a, uh, for a black body, um, it's the Stefan Boltzmann constant times the temperature to the fourth power. So that means we're now radiating less energy to space, but the same amount of energy is still coming in from the sun and getting absorbed. And so now there's an imbalance. More energy is coming in than is going out. And that means the Earth is taking on heat. That heat can go to multiple things. It can go to melting ice. Uh, it can be transferred into deep into the ocean. Um, or it can be used to heat the surface of the planet. Only the last one helps bring things back into balance because it's the surface temperature that determines the temperature at altitude. So it's not all going go into surface heating, but sooner or later it will. Uh, the other aspect 
of the heating is that due to the clausius clapeyron equation, the atmosphere can hold more water vapor as it um, warms up. So basically, CO2 is like a control knob on the water vapor in the atmosphere. Uh, if there were no CO2 and no methane, uh, we'd be living in a snowball, basically. Uh, and there wouldn't be any moisture in the atmosphere. So um, in order to get things back into balance, the surface temperature all the way up to the um, effect of atmosphere of radiation to space has to increase. Um, and that's what we call global warming. And it's that simple. I mean, you just have to have um, something that absorbs the infrared radiation, an atmosphere that is not isothermal, meaning it, it cools as you go to altitude, and, and the physical fact that the radiation depends, the amount of radiation depends on the temperature. Um, may I uh, just interject here, if you don't mind? Of, of course. Of course. Uh, I am curious about the mechanism for the ocean warming. I think I had sort of thought that the oceans warm directly from sunlight, but it sounds like what you're saying is the oceans also warm because of the warming atmosphere. And is that just a matter of sort of convection at the ocean atmosphere interface or is there something more interesting um partly um yeah what vic just said air and oceans exchange heat um if ice melts on the ocean you've also got uh, lowered the um reflectivity of the ocean and it's going to absorb more heat uh, now when you think about how do you get um, warmer water to sink? Uh, it's often a salinity thing. They talk about um, uh, density. I mean, salt will increase the density of the uh, water. So if you have a warm water that's being evaporated, you're increasing the salinity of the water, and sooner or later that's going to sink down. And so there's a, a mechanism to get it into the deep ocean and away from the surface. Oh, I see. <clears throat> and is it also the case that the oceans are not able to radiate heat as efficiently because of the sort of the blanket of CO2 in the atmosphere of it? Uh, yeah, I mean, basically the the surface is radiating heat, and that includes the oceans. Uh, radiating heat in the infrared, and it, anything that's in a temperature uh, range will um, radiate um, infrared radiation. We radiate infrared, and that's used medically. Yes. So I, um, let me uh, then, um, if you don't mind, why don't we uh, give our other panelists an opportunity to chime in. Um, uh, uh, Vic, uh, would you like to uh, sort of uh, give us a little commentary on uh, what Wordsmith is? Sure. Okay. The first thing I mentioned was a misunderstanding which Wordsmith um, help ameliorate is basically the idea between climate change, which is occurring, that is, places are changing in different ways, and it's not just the climate that's changing, which is affecting us and the rest of the world, but, and then the idea of global warming, which is an overall trend. Uh, another misunderstanding, I said myth earlier, what I really mean was misunderstanding was that uh, Humans are not the only source of change. There's other natural causes, but the fact that we are impacting the world much more quickly than would be uh, naturally. That's what the idea of the anthropomorph or, yeah, anthropomorphic um, epic is. And so, for example, we're largely responsible for release of uh, so-called greenhouse gases beyond what they would normally do and also methane, for example, with cows and termites and such. And if we 
go on to warm the Arctic uh, permafrost and ocean bottom, then we will release other um, methane. Methane is a much more efficient greenhouse gas, so we're going to get kind of a, a greater effect. Uh, if I can also mention uh, this, uh, Sezuji was talking about climate deniers. One of the things about that, of course, is that we have a huge capacity to deny anything. I mean, people, some people deny the Earth is round. So other people say that we didn't go to the moon. Uh, we can deny death. We can deny things we're doing to ourselves that contribute to uh, problems. So it's easy to deny things when it affects others rather than ourselves. Um, and especially when it's going to cost money and time and effort. It's kind of like the inconvenient truth truth that uh, Al Gore mentioned. Another thing, I don't know whether uh, the other people will touch on this, but there's several effects of the kind of what I call the so what. In other words, every day there's a lot of temperature fluctuations during the day. So one to two degrees, if you haven't studied what that means, means globally is nothing uh, over the course of the day or the season. So people who have not studied this may say, well, so what, one to two degrees. The problem with that is that where humans are very, very adaptable so that we can just uh, move places or take shelter or whatever, but there's a lot of animals and plants that can't do that. And so, and they're also dependent on each other. So if you have a change, for example, in migration by a week, uh, it may affect, um, Two different species. If you have plants and animals that can't go anywhere, for example, in the ocean, ocean acidity, carbon dioxide isn't just a greenhouse gas. It also affects the acidity of the water. What that means is that marine plants, which like uh, reef builders and plankton, who need to build shells of calcium carbonate, here's the biochemistry part, is that uh, if they can't build their little homes, this is going to affect uh, or this is going to, to affect the food chain up and down uh, tremendously, which also impacts uh, uh, human po population, which is growing. Right now we're trying to worry about how we're going to increase food production because we're going to be adding 2 billion people in the next 30 years. The other thing that happened is that even above melting is that you get sea level rises. And that's simply because uh, liquids don't tend to expand much, but if you're talking about over the course of the ocean, you don't have to have much of an expansion to get sea levels to rise, um, promoting a danger to low-level communities, which actually can affect uh, hundreds of millions, if not a billion people and their economies, and also more energy for destructive uh, storms, as I mentioned, uh, methane, the Gulf Stream, uh, the Gulf Stream is what keeps uh, Europe relatively cool, excuse me, warm. Otherwise, it's far enough north that it would be a lot colder than it is if we didn't have it. The last misunderstanding is the lasting effects. I mean, let's say, for example, we all came to our senses and stopped things right now. Is that even right now, it's like... Um, Kinetic energy, things are not just going to stop. Uh, we can't just, for example, like reducing chlorofluoro, chlorofluorocarbon emissions and seeing some quick change in the ozone hole is that right now if we needed to stop everything, we would still see effects increase and last for centuries. And if uh, Wordsmith or Syzygy would like to expand on any of these or uh, verify what I'm saying, I'd be pleased. Uh, for the scientists to say something. Uh, yeah, Fantastic, uh, yes. Syzygy, please go ahead. Yeah, I'll, I'll jump in there. Uh, from what, I've, uh, from what I've learned is that um, <clears throat> the effects of the uh, rising temperature, the, the oceans becoming warmer, is, and Keith can correct me on, on some of these points, but one is that the storms become stronger, so you have stronger hurricanes. Uh, I don't know if it means necessarily more hurricanes, but uh, there do seem to be more of them, especially in the Gulf uh, each year, which may be a statistical fluke, or maybe that's the result of climate change. Another thing is that because the oceans are warming, they warm the air above it more, and the air, as the air gets warmer, it actually um, becomes more stirred up, and it causes higher ocean waves. So ocean waves are becoming stronger. Um, 
Another thing is that you have the uh, ocean level, the, the sea level, is rising. And apparently there are th at least three effects. One is that you have more tons of water falling into the ocean from melting ice, melting glaciers on land, melting uh, Greenland ice cap, uh, the melting uh, Antarctic ice cap, ice shelf, well, the part that's on land anyway. More tons of water go into the, the ocean. The sea level, of course, rises. But there's another effect, I think it's called the thermometer effect or the mercury effect, like the mercury in a thermometer expands as the temperature goes up, as the ocean warms, it expands, so a given number of tons of water will have more volume as they warm up. That's apparently something like a 40% effect in the rate of uh, sea level rise right now. Sea level rise is apparently something like 3 millimeters per year, so something like 40% of that apparently is the, expan the expansion due to rising temperature. And there's another effect which can actually go a little bit either way is the effect of the gravitational field of the ice of the ice sheets. So in Greenland, for example, if you have the ice sheet melting, it pulls on the water less because there's less ice on land pulling the water towards it. So the water moves away from it. So you have melting ice near Greenland actually causing the sea level to drop, at least locally out to as far as the British Isles, apparently. But beyond that, the, the, it, it causes the oceans to rise a bit because the water's not being pulled towards it by gravity. And that's an even bigger effect for the Antarctic ice sheet. So there are all these effects that are occurring. and They apparently have an effect that's something like, I don't know, like a few centimeters. OK, that's pretty nuts. I had not really thought about the effects of uh, gravity. Or on gravity, um, you know, Suzuki. One thing I am a little curious about is: um, does global warming affect the performance of uh, Earth-based telescopes in your business? Maybe I don't know infrared telescopes or our ability to, you know, look out through uh, through the sky uh, from Earth. Well, yeah, that's an interesting question. Um, I mean, Keith can address this better than I can, but there's, uh, of course. The difference between climate and weather, um, as as they say, climate's what we expect, weather's what we get. Um, the weather's been a little bit strange, uh, uh, certainly around here. So we've been having unusually uh, large numbers of clouds, which are, are making it difficult for certain observations, even at millimeter wavelengths, which is where, where I uh, where I do my observations. So we've been having strange weather on the mountain, um, which which can make things worse sometimes. But I imagine there are. Times Well, you also have more water vapor in the atmosphere. So if you're talking a, um, a wavelength in the near infrared or infrared where the water absorbs fairly strongly, uh, the more water you have in the atmosphere because CO2 has warmed it slightly to begin with, um, the less visibility to space you have. Um, Hmm, very interesting. Um, one of the topics uh, that uh, uh, we were considering talking about uh, that uh, I'm a little bit interested uh, in exploring now um, is this notion of you know, just the sheer amount of energy um, that is involved in a um, even what might seem a small uh, uh, Earth temperature of one and a half to two degrees. Um, would any of you like to just comment on sort of that, uh, just 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 the sheer amounts of energy that we're talking about. Let me jump in real quick, just to put it in kind of layman terms, is that you know how much energy and what it costs to heat your house. Okay, uh, even by a degree or so. Now, uh, try to heat something the size of a large building and think about what your heat bill would be for that. Now open up the doors and see if you can heat your city by one degree and how much energy you're talking about that and then extend it onto the earth and you're talking about an enormous amount of energy that's not going away uh, tomorrow. <laughs> and uh, so even one or two degrees is an incredible amount of energy that's been injected into our atmosphere that's not going away simply by trying to correct things. Uh, it's the famous dad complaint. What are you trying to cool the entire neighborhood when you leave the door open? 
Um, um, uh, Wordsmith, would you like to also maybe um, comment on uh, what kind of degrees of uh, energy or what uh, the <clears throat> sort of, I guess, give us a sense of the amount of energy that we're pouring into the atmosphere from the release of carbon that has been trapped for you know, hundreds of millions of years, and we're finally, it's been sequestered, and now it's being released all of a sudden in just a, a matter of a few generations. Well, I just, um, a new skeptical science had a page on that, and let's see, they're running, climate has accumulated 2,704,000,000 and uh, 1,108 Hiroshima atomic bombs of heat since 1998. Now, I actually thought they had the, the thing somewhere in cat sneezes, but uh, <laughs> as a unit. But, but that's a lot of energy. Um, and that isn't just the surface temperature increase, but uh, ice melt um, and um, you know, when, uh, the um, heat effusion of ice and then whatever warming uh, is done to the resulting water. So um, a lot of energy coming in every day. Uh, basically, the, the forcing of doubling CO2 um, was four watts, it has been estimated to be about four watts per meter squared all over the surface of the Earth. Man. The, um, uh, the causes of climate change, um, initially had, were sort of hotly contested. Um, I do get the feeling that most climate deniers have sort of finally come around, um, that there is a contribution from human activity. But, you know, for a while uh, there were all sorts of uh, explanations offered that uh, it was, you know, that we were in some kind of intense a period of solar activity or sunspots or, um, you know, that it, you know, our, it was our um, uh, proximity to the sun. Or the other thing, too, is that, uh, you know, cycles in climate are natural um, and that this is just another instance of um, a natural fluctuation in climate. Um, that last one has always particularly bothered me because um, it, you know, natural climate variation occurs over geological time periods, um, you know, not within the span of a human life or, or a couple of human lives. And the, I always felt it, that deniers were just turning a blind eye to the rapidity of the energy that we're pouring into the climate. Um, is it, uh, am I off base that for the most part, deniers have sort of given up on those kinds of um, explanations? Or what's your sense of uh, kind of what the, the state of the debate is? Um, if I might say something here, um, there's something called willful ig ignorance. And as, as Vic mentioned, like people who believe in a flat earth, for example, are willfully ignorant and climate. Climate change deniers are, are among those. Um, they, they are, they're right that there have always been variations, but the science on that, and, and Keith can um, elaborate on that, there, there are a number of reasons why the science shows that it strongly supports anthropology. Uh, one of those is that if you look at the ice cores that I believe both the North Polar, North, North Polar regions and the South Polar regions, that go back like 500,000 years, they show the amount of carbon dioxide in the air bubbles in the, in the ice cores. And they show that there's a there fluctuations in the amount throughout that time. But it's only during the last 150 years or so, 
Industrial Revolution, during the industrial uh, the time of the Industrial Revolution, that it has risen by an unusually large amount. So that's one one piece of evidence that this is epigenics. Of course, some will say that that's just a coincidence. Another point is that the amount of carbon, the amount of carbon in the atmosphere, the amount that has been added, and the amount that has been generated since the beginning of the Industrial Revolution by human beings is the same number. Certainties. It's another supposed coincidence. Another is that you have you have the uh, the carbon isotope ratio. I thought it was 13 carbon to 12 carbon, but maybe it's carbon isotope ratios. You have a certain carbon isotope ratio that you find in the uh, in fossil fuels. These were from living things, and uh, ones that you get from volcanoes, for example. The the natural level of the natural ratio you expect in the atmosphere. Well, it's been shifting over that time, over the last, especially over the last 150 years, it's been shifting towards the ratio that, that, uh, consistent with fo burning fossil fuels. Well, that's, uh, that isotope ratio is yet another piece of evidence that this is anthropogenic. Or Keith can elaborate further on this. Right. The, um, I, I think you had, uh, there is a, um, isotope ratio with carbon 13 to um, so you have carbon 14 depletion and also some source information um, of the carbon dioxide originally or the, the fossil fuels originally um, there seems to in, in a denier camp um, be a reluctance to realize that a lot of things have been looked at um, over the last hundred years and many of them have been found not to be um, not to be supported by the actual data um, for instance there was the uh, idea that cosmic rays would uh, create uh, cloud nucleation particles but those particles are very small and there's a threshold between what will grow and become a cloud uh, particle and particles below that threshold um, just don't grow they're not large enough it's kind of like they're too small a target for an extra water vapor to bump into compared to the much larger particles and particle size is not just a stable it's a continual exchange between different particles um, in terms of traditional climate change forcing it's often felt that um, when the northern summer um, when the northern hemisphere summer isn't receiving enough sunlight that that can then the snow that falls doesn't completely remove during the summer and starts accumulating but that isn't going to happen now and isn't happening now because the eccentricity is too low the the orbit just doesn't go um, out far enough and then be in sync with summer uh, so that we start accumulating ice and snow on the North American continent. Um, we're actually measuring the sun output, the total solar irradiance uh, above the Earth's atmosphere and since 1970 or so. And that isn't showing a sufficient increase or decrease to drive what we're seeing in the climate. So uh, you have to ask, you know, what is there else? And you also have to, since the physics supports um, heating from CO2, in that, even in that simple model I described a little bit earlier, you also have to explain why we wouldn't be seeing that. You know, what's exactly. the Earth doing? What, what's the Earth uh, doing that would negate that source of warming, and then what's the other source of warming that you would expect? And there isn't any right now. Uh, it's the old Holmesian expression, uh, once you've eliminated the impossible, 
whatever is left, however improbable, must be the truth. Um, uh, Wordsmith, um, another uh, um, argument that deniers make is that um, our global warming policy making is too dependent on modeling. Um, in fact, I think when the recent IPCC report came out, um, Sarah Huckabee Sanders, uh, the press secretary, um, sort of belittled it, saying, "Well, it's all just it's all just dependent on models, and we have different models than you have, or, or something to that effect." Um, uh, to, not to put you on the spot too much, but can you talk to us a little bit about how? Climate change is modeled and sort of maybe end the uh, science of modeling. Sure. Um, you know, I would say climate models, um, which increasingly get better because we can we have the compute power to um, compute the at higher resolution than we did even just a few years ago, and uh, the nation's moving to exascale uh, computing above uh, petascale. Now, um, one of the claims deniers make, um, can you hear me, Matt? Yes, I hear you. Okay, because my, uh, my visual froze for a minute. Uh, one of the claims deniers make is that the models aren't proved, and that's a very hard thing to do with the planet because it doesn't just willingly go back and replicate and let you try something uh, different. But what we can do is verify all the pieces and parts. The, the, the core of a climate model is really a weather model in terms of transporting. It may not be as high resolution and we have to run it for up to 30 years of modeling time to really assess a climate. But that core and the fluid dynamics is well known and is considerably used. I mean, we're using it in weather models, we're using it in other physical models that involve fluids. Um, what is added for a climate model uh, is what it's called column physics. So what happens to the surface? Uh, a weather model doesn't have to do with um, effects like ice melting over time, um, change in vegetation. Uh, a climate model does. And so these things are part theory and part comparison with measurements. Uh, there were people out there, and in fact, in 1989, it was the start of a program called the Atmospheric Radiation Measurement Program, which has a site in Oklahoma and one up at Barrows. And the, the whole idea is to be able to measure the components of the atmosphere, the sunlight, um, the radiation in a vertical um, profile going up and then see if we can connect those two uh, via a model and if we can then we feel uh, for different kinds of settings then we feel we have some um, reason to trust what the model that part of the model uh, outputs and um, a lot of that has been done uh, inner comparison of models has been done. Looking at statistics of the climate model um, with what we'd expect for the current atmosphere and uh, the records we have. Where's the precipitation? How much does it vary? All that kind of stuff has been done. So it's not like the models are just you know spun together in somebody's imagination. And th that really is the difference between the science models and you know the denier quote models. I think um, 
you know, if anything, the recent IPCC report suggests that if anything, our models have been too conservative. <laughs> um, and I think that part of the alarm was to, sort of a realization that uh, things could happen quicker than we had kind of been thinking they, they would be. Um, and something else to touch upon what you said, it's my understanding that over the last uh, <clears throat> maybe five or 10 years, um, <clears throat> a new science, the science of attribution <clears throat> has emerged um, <clears throat> and that uh, scientists are now um, able to attribute specific weather events um, to global warming with much higher confidence than they could, let's say, a decade ago. Um, I don't know too much about, you know, how that confidence has come about, um, but there is enough confidence in attribution um, for a, a discipline to have arisen around it. Um, would anyone like to speak to that? Before we get into that, I would like to uh, um, expand a bit on what, what Keith said earlier. Now, this is a, a question I receive uh, in one form or another all the time. Well, you have these scientific models, I mean, calculations. So what? This is just something you do on paper or something you do on a computer. And Keith has, has already mentioned, but I'm going to emphasize here, is that these models are not in, in, in a vacuum. In, in a particular case, climate models, they're compared with data. There are observations all over the time. There are experiments, machines, there are satellites that are observing from, uh, from orbit. So there's a lot of data that are, are used to check the reality of these models. Another thing to keep in mind is that if you have enough evidence that something is happening, if this were, for example, CSI, these CSI shows have been very popular, reruns now, but um, for crime scene investigation, if you compile a certain amount of evidence, and you never, never absolutely prove the suspect committed the crime, there's always, you know, some uncertainty. But it's something like, you know, 90% certain that this, this person committed the crime, any reasonable person will say, send that person to jail. But when you have that same standard for climate change, or for evolution, for example, for people who don't believe in evolution, suddenly every tiny little imperfection, they seize upon that to prove that in their own minds that this science is wrong. And it doesn't make sense because if they suddenly looked at data that said this person evidence that this person committed a crime, they said, yeah, that person should go to jail. So it's, it's just a change in the way they, they look at things. It's, it's very biased, how huge is science. It's, it's willful ignorance. Is well, yes, I agree. And to some extent, I think the models, um, even though, you know, um, they're kind of like a hypothesis. Um, and the hypothesis is tested by sort of how well the model is able to predict what we experience over time. And, um, you know, I think, especially over the last decade or so, um, the, our models have proven to be, you know, pretty good predictors. But that gives you a lot of confidence that we're, that our models are on the right track. It might be that, um when say, uh, say not predictor but projector and there's um, a difference that a weather model can predict about two weeks out um, and it's not that its prediction uh, then looks like nonsense it just doesn't match the real world and in fact in doing weather modeling these days they're doing ensemble modeling where they run many um, runs with slightly different initial conditions. And, uh, there was a case, uh, Palmer, can't remember his first name, uh, talked about it AGU, you know, maybe seven years ago, uh, about a severe storm in England that at the time all the weather forecasts missed. And they've gone back since then and done this ensemble models and our ensemble runs and a few of those actually predicted the storm and the conclusion is you know some things are fairly easy to predict um, weather-wise and some things are very difficult because they 
depend on some small difference, and yet the results are greatly different. Um, climate models run in a slightly different state, and I mentioned 30 years before, and it's statistical um, in the sense that the model captures the features that the uh, actual Earth goes through, but not necessarily at the same time. It's like you're modeling an infinity of different Earths, and they're slightly different. Uh, but if you look at the weather the climate model is producing at any point, um, it's a it's a parallel Earth. I mean, if a person were on the planet that matched that prediction, you wouldn't look around and say, you know, this weather is really strange for the Earth. Um, so things like um, ocean oscillations, which can last a decade, or um, El Nino, um, won't necessarily happen at the same time in a model as happens on Earth. So you can't do a one-to-one -one comparison at that point. But you can look at the 30 years of statistics that the Earth and the model produce. Yeah, I, I think it might be also useful, since we have a climate scientist here, to actually do some, uh, ask some basic questions. Keith, could you dis uh, distinguish for us between weather and climate? Yes, thank you. That, there's the old uh, saying that uh, climate is what you expect and weather is what you, uh, what you get. But even a, a weather model, you could start saying, you know, what are all the possible models if we start, our uh, possible results if we start um, predicting the weather up to two weeks out uh, today? And they'll vary. And the current state of the art is to come up with some synthesis of that. Now, I mean, some of those models don't match what we actually get. Um, so climate has to average um, over, you know, decadal ocean oscillations, and there are some. There's a Pacific o uh, oscillation, an Atlantic oscillation, where there are sort of two different modes the ocean can get into, or ENSO off the um, west coast of South America, where um, you either have upwelling uh, water bringing deep nutrients up, or you have um, water that's more or less laying on the surface and staying warm. So the the a climate really has to average all be long enough to average over all of that kind of thing, which is why they they basically say thirty years. That's part of why climate runs are costly because it takes a lot of computer time to run 30 years on a um, high resolution scale. Um, uh, if you don't mind, um, uh, just to change gears a little bit um, to try to get through our topics, um, I'd just like to raise uh, one of the uh, comments in the IPCC report is how uh, enduring the uh, changes to the climate are going to be. Um, that is, even if we were to stop um, pumping CO2 into the atmosphere today, um, it could take millennia for uh, the Earth to sort of um, uh, you know, uh, establish an equilibrium, I guess, comparable to what we have today. Um, so, uh, so the changes we're going to be seeing on the planet are, you know, in a, in a certain sense, all for all intents and purposes, are going to be permanent. So we're going to be looking at, you know, changed habitats, perhaps, for example, perhaps the permanent loss of um, of coral reefs, 
um, uh, you know, entire, you know, we'll, we're going to go through sort of mass extinctions. Um, now, no doubt we will see the, and perhaps, I guess I shouldn't say no doubt, but perhaps we will see the emergence of, of new species um, that uh, will be adapting to these new environmental niches and so forth. Um, would anyone like to kind of expand on that? Well, one thing I would like to say is um, uh, life itself is 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 extremely um, is extremely re resilient in the long term. So, in the news, I saw something which is absolutely horrible that since the 1970s, like 60 percent of all animal species have, have gone extinct. And now coral reefs are going extinct. But in the long term, will coral reefs actually go extinct? Some fraction of those will be resilient to the, the acidification of the oceans. And so maybe they will eventually spread around the world. Uh, that'll take a long time. But so uh, in the long term, they say that Mother Earth is dying. Mother Earth is not. Dying. Mother Earth is maybe having a, a fever for a while. But Mother Earth will do. If you look at world, okay, if you look at the history of the Earth over a long period of time, there have been times like Wordsmith was saying where the Earth literally was a snowball. I mean, it happened long ago, but it was several periods uh, before the atmosphere that we have now. But do we really want to, for example, the carbon dioxide right now is similar to what it was 30 or 40 million years ago. Do we really want to live in that time period because it would essentially <laughs> affect all the plan, plants and animals that we have on Earth. Sure, of course, the Earth's going to rebound and stuff, to, but do we want to be there when it does? Uh, do we want to have the population that we have when it does? Uh, what's going to happen in the interim with uh, trying to feed the number of people we have? Or, uh, I mean, every the whole ecology of the Earth could change dramatically if the earth warms too much or ocean acidity and reefs die and such like that. Sure, of course, the earth's going to be around for a, a billion years and then, of course, the sun's going to get too hot and it's going to uh, boil everything away anyway. So, um, you know, but a billion years is <laughs> the idea is do we want to be there? Do we want that kind of earth? Uh, there's enormous problems with what we're doing right now. Well, uh, <clears throat> Um, yeah. Yeah, well, Vic, I just wanted to touch on, uh, um, uh, well, uh, this notion that in the past, um, <clears throat> Snowball Earth and other long, large-scale climate changes did occur, you know, from our point of view, um, over gigantic swaths of time, geological time periods, um, and uh, those kind of slow changes give biology a chance to adapt. Um, you know, I think uh, part of the, the terror of what we're confronting now is that the change is happening so fast. It's happening faster than biology can adapt. So now, no doubt, we will see populations that survive, and they will endure, and then they will diversify. But again, that's going to happen over sort of evolutionary time scales. So, you know, we are really looking at um, uh, at profound, uh, 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 you know, a profoundly different Earth. Um, and oh, so what I was going to say is that the, the slow changes, you know, the nature is so adept at creating life that sort of occupies every possible niche from which life can extract energy. And um, so, you know, we just see this incredible abundance of life on Earth, um, primarily due to the fact that the Earth changes slowly, that habitats are stable, um, and that, you know, this gives, sort of this, in a sense, gives life the confidence to expand into niches because it is stable. Um, and in an unstable environment, um, you know, life might be more cautious about expanding into niches. I mean, I'm sort of anthropomorphizing here, as you can see, but I think you get the idea. Yeah, I, 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 while I have optimism in the long term that life will survive, that doesn't mean I, I, I'm happy with the way things are going now. I don't want human beings to, to, to be suffering. I don't want to lose our worldwide civilization if we can avoid it. 
I want us to be better stewards of the earth in ways, if that can I think there, there's still hope. There's also the, the worry that, um, you know, we're playing with things that we don't really know the results of. For instance, if the Gulf Stream shut down because the um, the difference between the tropics and the poles got small enough that the forcing just didn't create a Gulf Stream. Um, even if we went back, what would it take to restart it? There's uh, you know, the effect called hysteresis, where you have one path in, but it takes a different path out. Um, one of the fairly recent papers um, explained the hundred million year or no hundred thousand year cycle um, in um, ice sheets and that isn't in the solar forcing. Uh, the explanation was partly as the ice gets further south but also there's a hysteresis and compression of the crusts underneath this tremendous weight of ice and as the ice goes this doesn't just spring back so there's a actually a tipping point that could go through several you know s s solar orbital cycles um, before it tips and goes the other way just because things are changing, like compression of the crust. Um, yes. Um, you know, that's kind of fascinating to me, the fact that climate um, and geology interact uh, like that. I think um, that's a little bit counterintuitive for a lot of people um, that, um, that uh, and particularly, you know, the, the, in a sense, the, you know, the crust of the earth is part of its geology. The ice, the polar ice caps, part of the geology of earth, affected by the climate. So you do have this kind of um, very subtle interplay between geology and climate. And it might not always be so subtle in, in, in the sense that uh, uh, climate change can actually uh, uh, cause earthquakes. There's there's uh, evidence that that could happen because as the ice is melts into the sea, uh, it releases the the it releases the land below it, which which rebounds as, as Keith has mentioned. Those rebounds can cause stress. Well, all right, this is all very sobering. Um, we're a little bit over our hour period. Um, maybe we should uh, think about wrapping it up. Um, does anyone else have some uh, additional thoughts that uh, you didn't have a chance to uh, express? And uh, maybe we'll try to uh, just mention a few things that uh, you didn't get a chance to, and then maybe we can um, uh, bring this discussion to an end. Sure. Uh, one real quick point, and and somebody mentioned it's dinner time. <laughs> Agatha, I guess they live where it is dinner time. But um, I take the National Geographic, and the entire issue uh, lately was on changing food. I mean, we could. Uh, I think we've gone pretty far as far as uh, temperature rise and such, and there are going to be effects which we're just not going to be able to wish away. But on the other hand, just changing the way we eat globally could make a lot of difference. If you look at a, the amount of land which is pasture land or which, uh, for example, just to raise meat and uh, how much of our food production goes into that and the effects of uh, cows and <laughs> you know clear, clearing uh, forests and stuff could be, if we just change some habits, we could at least push some of this down decades in the future instead of uh, having it visit us at a really awful time when the Earth's population is getting larger. So yeah, globally, and even in places like the United States, which uses a lot more energy and a lot 
Uh, than other places, uh, if if everybody just said yes, let's do this, then of course we could make an enormous difference. So I guess I'm an optimist in that respect. Whether we do it or not, hey. Well, well on that note, uh, there apparently is a way to do that. There's a way of actually converting desert, at least some parts of deserts, back into grassland. Ted talk on that. Taste that local. Alan Savory, who's had experience with this, where he's actually moved the herding animals because some land, grassland was turning to desert, so he removed the, the herd animals and even had to kill a number of elephants to do this. It was decades ago. Tragic killing elephants. And the, and the problem got even worse. But he found that if he reintroduced uh, grazing animals into the edges of deserts, then slowly the grasslands ex expand. And if you have enough grasslands, you can make a, an impact on, on global warming. One thing I wanted to just make a note of is the topic of migration. Um, you know, in the distant past, if the climate changed a little bit and the rainfall didn't come um, and people were more nomadic, then you could um, sort of counter the climate changes um, with moving locations. Um, at this point, moving locations, you, you have these things called borders and people with guns that point them at you and uh, shoot you if you try to mi uh, migrate or try to build walls to keep you from migrating. Um, so it's the historical way of countering changes isn't going to work very well. Uh, unless we become a lot more sociable and forgiving species. Um, so I think it was in the Sudan that drought aggravated um, interactions between nomadic people and um, farmers who had settled down and suddenly there wasn't the water and um, food to support both and uh, that gets very quickly into conflict um, yes I'm really glad you uh, raised the issue of migration um, it seems to me that we are already experiencing the effects of climate change migration um, uh, notably in Europe um, and discouragingly but predictably, um, you know, rather than uh, the response being, you know, open hearts and open arms, uh, what we are seeing is the rise of right-wing um, um, nationalist politics arising um, that is anti-immigration. Um, uh, this political shift is threatening. Uh, the post-World War II order that was established specifically to suppress nationalism after our experiences in the 20th century. Um, and this is, a, in my mind, a horrifying development and partially a consequence of climate change. Yes, well, uh, that brings up a very important point. Uh, there's a documentary I saw which lays this out very nicely. It's called Age of Consequences. I strongly recommend that everyone see that documentary because the effects of climate change are already killing people. And, and I'll, I can give uh, easy examples. One is the Syrian civil war. That started with uh, drought in, the, in like 2005, 2006. There were years of drought. And farmers had to move because they couldn't, they couldn't survive on the land, so they moved into Damascus. And, of course, people will point out Conservatives will point out, well, there, was, there were historical problems there, historical political tensions, there were, there were cultural problems. And the answer is absolutely right. That's what I call the gasoline. Climate change is the spark. The, the conflicts, it can actually cause the conflicts based on the, all the other problems. It can be the spark that causes those conflicts, and that's what happened in Syria. Without climate change, maybe the, the, this conflict would have happened anyway, eventually. 
Then there's Arab Spring. Then there's a re refu refugee crisis in Europe, as, as Paragon has pointed out. Uh, in these conflicts, especially in the Civil War, people are dying. So climate change is causing people to die, and directly from excessive heat, from droughts. We must do something. Suzuki makes an excellent point, and if you look at some of the projections, is that it's not far from now that we'll have what are called water wars. Uh, go ahead, word, wordsmith. It looks like you might be. Um, what you were saying uh, on water wars just reminded me that um, not all water gets transferred as, quote, water, but we have um, uh, virtual water transferred in import and export of um, things that are grown, for instance, that take water, um, or things that are manufactured that require water in the manufacturing. And so you not only have the water that falls and the water you see, but you have this whole virtual transport of water. And if drought changes that, um, whole economies, in a sense, could go south. Um, there's also a feature that if the um, water and sunlight or rainfall change and migrate slightly north or south, you're dealing with different soil conditions now. The soil may not be the same and the same crop that you had before may not grow well. Another issue that used to be when, okay, I'm showing my age, but um, when I went to college in the 70s, one of the issues was population. And we don't like to say that anymore. Uh, it, it does come up. But back when we had fewer people, I mean, when I was born, there was half the people that there are now. And we're adding whole cities every day, uh, pretty much worldwide, and looking at another 2 billion in the next 30 years. Uh, but this is an issue. I mean, there's more people, more uh, crop production. As I mentioned, National Geographic has a great issue on food production. They don't, they don't mention, mention population per se directly as the major cause, but they basically say that we're going to have to increase food production, doubling it. Um, and the reason we don't mention population much, I guess, is because there's no real good way to uh, address it uh, that that is uh, politically correct or sustainable or whatever. Uh, but that that definitely is um, underlying the whole problem. More people. Yeah, uh, Vic, I, I appreciate you raising that issue. It is uh, a sensitive issue. I think you're right. It uh, um, it is an important factor. It is hard to believe. Uh, barely sustain the population we have now. Much much less. More, but um, it, it is uh, you know very challenging to come up with uh, solutions that aren't cruel. Back here again, when I was in school, there was a, a Paul Ehrlich about the population boom then, and a book called uh, Famine 1984. And the issue there that we could see again if due to either sea level rise or changes in, like we've said, where uh, there is arable soil and good climate and such like that, is the issue that there are certain countries that are going, that can actually help. In other words, they have more food and money. And then there are other countries that can sustain themselves. And then there are other countries which it's going to be very difficult for them to be alive, period. And that was the that was the premise of the book Famine 1984, and we could face that kind of um, problem again. It's not a good prospect. Yeah, and um, you know, I think one reason population isn't discussed more openly is that there have been um, sort of population hysteria scares in the past, but somehow we see it managed to keep producing enough food or making enough shelter that, you know, we've somehow been able to adapt to this large population. And I think that has 
uh, made policymakers a little bit uh, complacent about the population issue, thinking, well, we'll just figure out some way to adapt to it. The population issue is 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 uh, is is, a ma uh, is is key to a lot of these things, as as Vic has said. Um, if, if there were a smaller population, then we wouldn't have the problems with climate change. Um, if you'll indulge, uh, go ahead. Is that something to say, Baragon? Oh well, uh, actually, just to kind of backtrack a little bit, I felt like I should acknowledge. Um, some commentary in our nearby chat, specifically with respect to migration, because I had said that European migration was driven in part by climate change, um, but but my statement is being disputed, um, and I just feel like I should acknowledge that, that I'm certainly no expert on sources of European climate change. Um, although I have heard that, you know, that the, that, uh, migration out of the Middle East and Syria is in part driven by climate change. I don't know how much of that is making its way into Europe. Um, and I do think that European migration is also related to um, policies in the European Union, I suppose, and things like that. So I just wanted to go back and correct. Yeah, but I, I would also, again, I recommend seeing that documentary, Age of Consequences. Some of the European migration is from the Middle East and Africa. And that's because of drought in those areas. So that's been that's been driving the population away. They can't live anymore in that same area. Um, yeah, but, but then the question is, what can I mean? This is something. What can we do on a personal level to, to address you know, the climate you know, change? I actually want to challenge that a little bit because um, I I've been hearing more and more often that these calls for personal action on climate change are really just sort of feel-good initiatives to make to sort of empower people but that to have real you know effective change on carbon globally what we really need is you know systemic changes by the you know gigantic global corporations and um, and energy producers on the planet that's what is really going to Required, that personal changes are really just um, a way to sort of pacify the population. That might well, be controversial. That's, that's that's both true and false. That's a very good point. I mean, how much can individuals do and how much corporations can do? But how are the corporations going to change without grassroots movements? One thing I'm, uh, I'm suggesting is to get involved with demonstrations. For example, I was involved, I played a very small part in this demonstration, but it was in Vancouver where we're protesting the Trans Mountain Pipeline from the Alberta the tar sands, they call it oil sands, which is just spin, uh, the tar sands to, to the coast. Uh, we are, are protesting that pipeline. The government is being very wrong-headed about this. They claim to be very serious about climate change. Uh, the opposing party, the, the conservatives, would be even worse. They want even more pipelines. And this is absolutely insane. More pipelines? We don't need more pipelines. So it's only with the, the, enough demonstrations, enough letter writing, with enough resistance from the public that things will change. Right on, brother. <laughs> well said. Uh, well, that actually might be a good... Uh... A good spot to wind this up. We're we're almost at an hour and a half. I can't believe we uh, <laughs> we've uh, uh, we're able to fill up so much time, and I don't think we're finished talking. But we could go uh, for hours. We could go for hours. <laughs> I can't believe the audience is still here. <laughs> I know <laughs> they must be interested in this topic. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, thank you guys uh, so much uh, for. Um, uh, you know, devoting uh, your time out of the day to join us here in Science Circle for this. Um, Wordsmith and Pizigy, Vic, uh, you guys were all fantastic. And I also want to thanks to our loyal audience of Science Circle students who, um, you know, uh, are just always great and contributed a lot to this discussion. Um, and uh, with that, I will uh, bring this uh, this um, installment of Science Circle panel discussions to an end and bang my gavel. Good night, everyone. Good night, everyone. Thanks, 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 everyone. Thanks, thanks to my panel. Thanks to Matt. Thanks for coming. <laughs>